Hi, everybody, and welcome to week three of the discussion of genetic engineering and its relative risks and benefits and the mechanisms that we use to create genetically engineered plants and uh, the variety of products that we do, and in this case of today, maybe those that we don't necessarily use. And what I'd like to talk about today, it says GMOs, but it's a term I don't like using, but it's the one that resonates and one people understand. So we'll talk about, we'll talk about today, lecture three, the product pipeline. What are the things that scientists have uh, stayed at night looking at the ceiling, dreaming at a problem to solve, and come up with a solution that we don't use? And the reason I want to bring this up is because I want to show how important it is to be able to use this technology to solve problems that we care about, and then maybe help you share my frustration that we, you know, as a scientist, I want to fix things. And uh, our hands are tied a little bit, and we'll talk about that more in week four. It's always important for us to use the discussion of genetic engineering by starting with our values. You know, what's most important to us? And today, I'll show you solutions that really would be very helpful for farmers. They could help farmers. They could help consumers in the industrialized world um, in a variety of ways. We can find many of these solutions that can help emerging nations, can help people who are in need, and also solutions that can contribute to a healthier environment. So between farmers, consumers, the environment, and the needy, there are solutions that we have on the shelf that would be wonderful to implement, but we can't do it. And we'll talk about those today. And some of the specific examples, and these are, again, technologies that exist, not just ideas, but technologies that are proven, technologies that exist, that could uh, really help provide needed micronutrients for, world, for hungry populations. Um, 21,000 people a day die because of malnutrition. And at least a subset of these are due to missing something like vitamin A or vitamin B6 or iron. You know, just very small amounts of, of a micronutrient that contribute to larger physiological disorders that uh, then manifest as things like chronic diarrhea or other diseases or opening up the immune system to other diseases. Um, these are really important. We also have solutions that help mitigate the effects of viruses. So in plant populations in uh, the developing world, like cassava, a uh, virus is a huge uh, reason for loss of an important crop. And we'll talk about that today. And we'll talk about how we can use the same technology that we discussed in the last section for papaya to mediate or mitigate the effects on uh, cassava. Uh, we have plants that can grow in changing climate, um, and that's really important. And also plants that protect themselves from, from insecticides and other bacterial problems, uh, fungal problems. The big issue is, why don't we use them? And really what I'd like to use today to do is set up a question in your mind of saying, um, we got all these great technologies. They could solve problems that are important to us. What's going on? And then la la last week, week four, we'll talk about the resistance to the technology and why it's there and how we get around it. So probably the most important solution, or probably the most well-known solution, is one that comes from how do we fortify the uh, common staples of world populations? And one, one, some stuff that we commonly think about, uh, what are the world staples, the food staples? We think about things like rice. We think about wheat. We think about um, uh, a number of different ones, potatoes. What about some other less common ones? Things like eggplant, or they call brinjal in, in uh, parts of, uh, of Asia. Um, very important in places like India and Pakistan, um, Bangladesh. Um, cassava, very important uh, 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 plant organ that grows underground, that is uh, commonly eaten originally from South America, but eaten throughout Africa and also many places in Asia. Very important food staple. Um, bananas, okay, grown throughout the lakes region of Africa and other places throughout the world. Very important in terms of a starch. Um, not the dessert bananas that we have, but like a starchy banana. And one thing all of these plants have in common is very little vitamin A, very little iron, very little vitamin content at all. They're mostly a starch. They're an energy source, low in protein too. So one of the major thrusts of modern biotechnology has been how can we fortify these, these plants and these central food staples with some sort of chemistry, genes, that can confer traits that provide more nutritious food. The first example of that might be golden rice. And the map up in the upper left-hand corner there shows vitamin A deficiency. 
and vitamin A deficiency is highest in the red and orange areas and not such a problem in the green areas. The problem with vitamin A deficiency is that it starts mostly in affecting children. And the numbers here are really not very good. It says 250 to 500,000 children go blind each year. So somewhere in that narrow range, right? Uh, the numbers are probably more like a million children go blind every year because of vitamin A deficiency. And when you say, all right, out of a planet of 7 billion, that's not too much. Um, it's a lot if it's you, and it's a lot if um, it's completely preventable. And that's why I think this is such an important problem to think about. Um, it gets worse because most of the people who are affected by vitamin A deficiency die within a year. Um, and a report came out by Wessler et al. in 2014 that says that um, this, by not implementing golden rice, has cost 1.4 million human life years. So what is it that should have been done? So the picture in the upper right-hand corner shows standard rice in white and then this kind of orange color rice um, that is on the left, or I'm sorry, uh, on, the, on the right of the white rice. What's the difference? Well, they've been fortified with beta-carotene. Beta-carotene is the central um, nutrient that we think of when we look at carrots or other leafy green vegetables. It's that orange pigment that gives carrots their characteristic orange color. So beta carotene is produced from intermediates in plant metabolism that all plants have. All plants have on this panel on the lower left, the stuff called geranyl geranyl pyrophosphate. It's, it's a key component of, many, of, of a central plant biochemical pathway. What scientists were able to do we're able to tap into that store of that common metabolite and add a couple other genes that then would allow for the synthesis of beta carotene. Beta carotene could then be made in this plant or in this plant product that normally didn't create beta carotene. Basically, you're taking the metabolism of the plant and providing it with more tools to take a common product and convert it into something else that people need. This particular product would have probably very strong impact throughout the world. It's not going to sol solve the problem of vitamin A deficiency and blindness, but for some people it certainly would be a step in the right direction. And even if it helped keep your eyesight longer until other types of supplements or other forms could be had, this still would be a very important way to solve the problem for many people. The same technology was applied to cassava, and I mentioned cassava before. Uh, it's eaten throughout Africa and throughout places in uh, South America. It's a large starchy tuber that um, is white, white as snow. Um, this one over here on the, on the left panel, the furthest one to the right is what cassava looks like normally. It's just a white starchy compound that you would maybe mash and eat with beans or meat, vegetables. And again, very, very low amounts of vitamin A. The numbers here again need a little adjustment too. It says 250 million depend on cassava. That number is probably 800 million to a billion people eat cassava every single day. Um, one, one gentleman I spoke to on the podcast said uh, 5 p.m. every day. You would, eat, you would eat, sit down and, and eat the same thing every night. This is what you ate. And the problem is, again, very little nutrient content in terms of things like vitamin A, iron, protein. Um, the other big issue is uh, something called cassava brown streak virus or cassava mosaic virus, a couple different viruses that lead to a rot inside the cassava itself, inside the organ that you consume. And you can see up in this uh, farmer's hands here, the uh, brown that's caused, that makes that unsaleable. It's spread by an insect, spread by white flies, um, and rapidly can move through a population. But the cassava is a big, resilient plant, and you don't know that you have a crop that's been damaged by the virus. So scientists have stepped in in two different ways. The first thing they did was make this relatively non-nutrient uh, crop full of nutrients by adding the uh, hardware to make vitamin A through beta carotene. And um, I neglected to mention earlier, you're actually producing beta carotene, which is then cleaved by the body to produce vitamin A. I neglected to mention that. So you don't actually fortify this with vitamin A, you're fortifying it with beta carotene, which is converted by your body to vitamin A. Very important because vitamin A is a toxic compound uh, unless it's carefully regulated by the, by the body's physiology. So to return to this picture, the, the two big uh, cassava pieces on the, on the uh, left have an orange cast, which comes from that fortification with beta carotene.
but they also have iron in increased amounts of protein. There also is a virus resistance, resistant cassava, which uses the RNAi technology we talked about last session to be able to de degrade the RNA that's associated, the genetic material of the virus, uh, to stop the virus and stop the viral infection. Both of these technologies work great and are on the ground in places like Uganda, uh, places like Kenya. The problem is, is that they exist behind a, a barbed wire fence uh, where only researchers can have access to them. They are not yet available to African farmers who in that area are primarily smallholder farmers of five to ten acres and um, a lot of them are women. This kind of technology would be of tremendous benefit to not only providing uh, a better saleable, better marketable um, uh, a product for smallholder farmers, but also would be great for the nutrition of the region. Yes? So I've been told why it's not out yet. It hasn't been released yet to the public, mostly because of, for a couple of reasons. Um, one of those reasons is just because the folks who have made it, which has mostly been done by the governments there, uh, in conjunction with Gates money, are ensuring that it works and ensuring that it's going to work as, as promised. The other side of that coin is that organizations like Greenpeace have a tremendous presence on the ground in those countries. And you can listen to the radio in, in Uganda and listen to uh, Greenpeace say that these are unnecessary and will cause sterility and cause cancer. So there's a polluted environment, um, at least a polluted rhetorical environment, where these products are attempting to be introduced. We'll talk a little more about that next week, or well, in week four. But the major idea here is just that here's a product that could be deployed that hasn't been deployed for many reasons, much of which have to do with an overdose of precaution, sadly. Yes? Oh, so the question was, do you see um, any uh, tests with the virus and virus adapting to the resistance? And um, the, it has, has been tested, certainly, and you don't see virus resistance to this kind of strategy very often. Um, it's worked durably in papayas for almost 20, for, for 20 years now, and uh, all 18 years, and um, works very well with this type, the way, with the mechanism used in the suppression of the virus is very durable. Um, so it, it looks pretty good. The other thing they're learning a lot about are the flies that spread the virus. And so, again, the genetic engineering end isn't, uh, isn't a silver bullet solution, and it never will be. But it's part of this integrated approach that with better plant varieties through breeding, by adding the genetic engineering, by managing the pest in a better way, that all these things together could be good relief for the farmers. That also will stave off any... Uh, less of a chance of resistance because cultural practices will be enhanced to stop the virus as well as uh, controlling the pest. So all these things together, and that's the best way for us to think about these technologies as part of an integrated series. So yes? One more question. So is there any like, proof or backing to like, what you saying that it causes like, cancer or all that? Yeah, so the question is, are there, is there any evidence that indicates that they cause cancer or could contribute? And no, there's not. And it's not even feasible as to why they would, because you're installing the same genes that are present in things like carrots and spinach and sweet potatoes. They're genes that synthesize beta carotene from a common substrate. And there's, you, know, there, you could imagine, if you get way out there and try to think of you know, what is even plausible, maybe you could think of ways that something could happen. but um, it's highly, highly unlikely, next to zero, and then when you test, you don't find any examples. The sad part is, is that even when, uh, when interests from the West say, or even you know, in, in, this, in these countries, that we're going to perform the tests, people push back about doing the tests. And that's what happened with the next product, um, the uh, beta carotene enriched banana. And this is a really cool one, because it uses a banana, it uses the beta carotene uh, genes, synthesis genes, from a banana. So there's a banana that grows in Fiji called um, Asapina, and Asapina is an orange banana, but it's not something that people eat, it's not, or at least not in areas of Africa, it's not in what they call matoke, which are the starchy bananas that you would eat for dinner. Um, they don't have the same beta carotene levels. And you can take the beta carotene genes from, synthesis genes from Asapina, from Fiji, and they've introduced those into 
the bananas that are grown as a staple food throughout the African continent. And uh, this is James Dale, who's shown on the slide here. His group down in uh, Australia has, uh, has generated these plants. Uh, they're probably a year or two out. Um, his story on the podcast is fantastic because he talks about how he's received by small banana farmers um, and how excited people are on the ground to have these products. Of course, all done with extreme caution that's keeping them from moving slowly through the system. A couple of years ago, they tried to do a test at uh, Iowa State University to determine uh, if a college student ate uh, in, um, nine bananas. Um, you got something like, you know, 900 bucks to eat a few bananas. And then they would do blood draws to see if your vitamin A levels were high. And uh, there were protests against it. And people who stood up, uh, students who said, we will not be, uh, uh, you know, doing the, the dirty work for the GMO industry. And, and this isn't the GMO industry. This is, you know, the country of Uganda working with a guy from Australia to make a banana that can help people. And uh, they never did the trials. And the woman who was, worked, was the scientist who was an expert in detection of vitamin A and carotenoids in the blood, um, she was threatened. Uh, she had all kinds of other hassles. And she, she just wants to see what kind of vitamins are in the blood. So it was a really ugly situation that happened around a simple test to determine, is this safe and is this effective? So scientists are up against quite a bit. And we'll talk about that next week, too. Uh, the other thing that's really important in bananas is the prevention of disease. And we know that the banana that we eat, this Cavendish banana, is under tremendous pressure right now from Fusarium tropical race 4. And um, it's also true in the developing world. Uh, huge amounts of uh, banana problems from Xanthomonas, from Fusarium, from uh, there's a disease called black cicatoga. There's all these different banana diseases, viral banana diseases. Um, Yet there are solutions to these bacterial and fungal problems and viral problems. Uh, there's a, a number of genes which have been discovered, again, by scientists in Kenya uh, working in conjunction with Gates Foundation and other, um, other, other funding sources to identify genes that can fortify bananas against these diseases. And here's a picture over here of a of a gentleman looking at some bananas that have gone bad because of disease, and then some plants that are looking pretty good growing behind a fence. And uh, those are the kinds of thoughts that, uh, you know, that these are technologies that can benefit people, and it's a shame they move as slow as they do uh, towards regulation. Uh, this is an example of one kind of gene, which has been used uh, called XA21. It's actually a rice gene that confers resistance of, to a disease in banana. And this is um, one really nice example. Uh, for xanthomonas resistance in banana. The one on the left is not transgenic. It does not carry the genetic engineering trait, where the three on the right are genetically engineered to protect the plant against the pest, against the pathogen. These are just uh, one, this is just one example for xanthomonas. There's also solutions for black cicatoga, for uh, um, fusarium, for um, uh, the other one, for virus, which causes something called banana bunchy top. Um, all of those are published. They're completed. They're studies that have been done, and they look awesome. And here's an, it just great ways to be able to defeat a lot of the common problems and disease in bananas with genetic engineering. So in the industrialized world, we see another set of problems. Uh, we see um, increases in allergies to peanuts. We see increases in allergies to wheat. And we can argue why that happens. You know, there's a couple different uh, hypotheses on the table. But the bottom line is, is that we can come up with technologies to suppress the proteins that contribute to that allergenic response. This has been done in peanuts. And this is a really nice example. It's a bad slide for it because it's too much detail. But suffice it to say that this RNAi technology, this interference, this remember the, the analogy of the hard drive and the USB drive in the printer, it basically targets the intermediate. It removes the transient intermediate in order to turn off the gene. And what has been done is that peanuts have a couple of different seed storage proteins. One major one is called ARAH2. And that one has been suppressed using this technology. Uh, others as well. Um, there's been some that can target multiple seed storage proteins and still have reasonable quality peanut. Uh, in the near future, there, this CRISPR-Cas9, this gene editing technology we discussed, uh, will be used to be able to edit the sequences in the DNA that contribute to the parts of the peanut proteins that cause the allergic responses in humans. 
And that work is well underway. I uh, recently did a podcast on this one too, which is probably, I think, number 49. Um, that may be worth checking out. A really important application, oh, this is, this is um, I mentioned, this is probably something that could be beneficial to industrialized world consumers. You know, kids who have to go to peanut-free classrooms, you know, or, or someone on an airplane uh, makes an announcement that they are allergic to peanuts, and now you get your choices between pretzels and biscotti cookies because you can't have peanuts open in the plane. A lot of um, allergies that can be life-threatening, and so we have to take them very seriously. The other place where allergies have been suppressed is in wheat. So there's a certain number of the population, somewhere between 1% and 3%, which exhibit celiac symptoms in response to certain wheat proteins. So two proteins, glutenin and gelatin, which are combined to be uh, described as gluten, these two proteins work to give bread its structure. And they're, they're, they're proteins that are used frequently. Uh, they're part of wheat uh, and other plants, uh, but pre predominantly wheat that contribute to the structure of bread, yet trigger an allergic response in sensitive people. Uh, scientists have also been able to suppress those wheat proteins and still have other proteins that give the bread some reasonable structure. And now it's a very strong effort uh, using gene editing to just delete out those few sequences that cause the, that trigger the allergy but leave the rest of the protein intact. And those are also currently being done to uh, create safer celiac safe wheat. Another place where we saw some rather um, startling effects of uh, disease has been in animals. And last year, bird flu was something that was on everybody's mind because of the number of uh, chickens and turkeys that were affected in the Midwest. It was estimated that something like 45 million birds were bulldozed uh, with a total cost of $2 billion to the industry. And yet in 2011, there was a paper that was published about how avian influenza could be suppressed by a really clever mechanism. Basically what happens is the bird that gets sick gets sick and will die, but can't spread the disease. The virus replicates in that bird but stops there. And it's done in a very clever way that the plant has been engineered with a piece of uh, DNA that produces a kind of a bait. So now the proteins that are required for viral replication go to that bait and stick there and don't bother making more virus. So why that one bird gets sick and dies, it doesn't spread rapidly throughout the bird population. And this would be a wonderful way to be able to fortify uh, um, poultry interests against such diseases. Um, they can be extremely problematic. And as we've seen, um, avian influenza can potentially even move into humans. So protecting birds with a genetically engineered solution could be a really important uh, way to prevent human disease and also really think about animal care, that sick birds uh, that don't suffer uh, also is something in everybody's interest. Another product that recently has been approved is the Aqua Bounty Salmon. This is really exciting because this was originally, and the paper I show here came from Nature in 1989. So this technology has been alive and well for a long time. And uh, the Aqua Bounty Salmon, and what you're seeing are these two salmon. So one of them is uh, the little guy there is a normal salmon after, say, I think it's a year and a half, where after the same year and a half, the other salmon is market size. So what this, this genetic engineering tweak does is it allows a fish to get to its marketable size in half the time. Why that's important? Well, if you're a farmer, uh, uh, um, a farm, salmon farmer, and you can get your product to the market with half the input, that's a good thing. Half the food, half the maintenance half the, you know, all the other things that go into raising farmed salmon. So you can get it to market size in half the time. The other good thing about this is you don't affect wild populations. And when we talk about overfishing in certain areas, it certainly does have its effect on wild populations. And by having confined populations that can be grown in inland tanks that have no way of escaping into the wild, these salmon could be a very important part of providing high protein food sources especially to people who normally don't have access. It could dramatically bring down the price of salmon and also protect um, uh, wild populations. The other, oh yes, you might be asking the question that I was going to go for. Would there be a problem if fish get out into the population? Wow, you read my mind. So the question was, would the uh, salmon be a problem if it escaped? And these are triploids, so they're not able to reproduce. They don't produce um, fertile gametes. They're, um, and uh, they're deliberately made to have a block and being able to reproduce. 
plus the, uh, the company has all these multiple levels of, of screens on every single drop of water that leaves the place. Um, there's no way anything could escape um, unless it walked out. So, in, so if it evolved quickly and walked away. We, no, but the long story short, it, it is a lot of protections. Plus they're in Prince Edward Island and in Costa Rica, so places where they're not uh, adjacent to any wild populations. Uh, but again, a really interesting technology that has some uh, ability to do some good things, but again, has been on the shelf for an awfully long time. It was approved about a year ago, and it hasn't been released for production because they don't know how to label it, and they don't know exactly, wanted to work all this out before they started to allow it for production, but coming close. The next one is really, really important. Uh, genetic engineering has been used to suppress mosquitoes. And this is a really important technology that I really want you to understand because this works in the lab and has not been used yet, it hasn't been actually released. And I think it's important for us to understand this because as we see, you know, malaria is a tremendous killer. Mos mosquitoes are, are uh, among the most dangerous, or are the most dangerous animal on the planet. Um, Zika virus, as it moves through the industrialized world, will get more and more attention and people looking for remedies. So what you're looking at here are the way that, is the way that this works. The way that it works is that you have a normal mosquito, which is uh, producing eggs that are hatching and becoming a larval form. The genetically engineered mosquitoes contain a gene that is lethal, that is turned off by tetracycline. So in the lab, you can grow the, you can grow the larvae mosquitoes, and the gene is turned off because you give them a little tetracycline that shuts that gene off. Now when you put those into the wild, or into um, metropolitan areas, whatever, and now they mature and become full-grown mosquitoes, that uh, they go out and mate and do their thing and pass along that tetracycline uh, they pass along that lethal gene, only no tetracycline. So the idea now is that in the absence of that repressive activity, the lethal gene is expressed, so anybody who mates with that mosquito dies. It's really important because the female mosquito, once she mates, that's it. She's, got, she, she's mated, and all of her offspring will come from that in the original male, that first fertilization. So the idea is, is that in the lab, you can shut down the, the lethal gene. You let the mosquitoes go in the wild. They mate, and all of their offspring are, are, are sterile. The technique has been amazingly effective in places like Brazil, where they have actually have done this. It could be very important here and has been proposed to be done in the Keys, but that was blocked at the last minute. Um, this is something that uh, I think you will see be a, a major contributor in the near future. Um, yes, let me ask both answer all the questions. Okay, Andrea. Um, is there a chance that the larva has any correlation that we don't know for the bacteria and we're actually teaching it to be the recycling resistance? Yeah, so the, the question came, can you, does this somehow make, uh, introduce a tetracycline resistance gene to the, uh, to the uh, wild? It, it, actually, that's where it came from. So it's not like it's uh, something new. It's a gene that exists in bacteria that, that works on this tetracycline um, derepression. Um, it, so it's nothing new to biology. And uh, basically by putting this into an organism where it's a dead end, kind of assures that you release it and it's, it's done. You know, you're, you're, re you're releasing a car into a dead end street. And it ain't going to go anywhere else. It's very highly unlikely. You can't say zero, but you know, as close to zero as you can get. But, and the other question. How expensive is it? If it's just like one female per like, many house individuals. Yeah, how expensive is it? Now, this is a good question. Actually, you know, scientists have been controlling insects like this for a long time. And what they did was they used radiation to sterilize uh, huge amounts of, uh, of, of mosquitoes and then just release the radiation damaged ones. And they were damaged enough where their offspring couldn't uh, be viable. So they, scientists have been, well, we've been doing this for mosquito abatement for years and other insects too. Um, we're seeing a higher incidence of something called screwworm in cattle. Which, was, uh, which has been repressed since the 1930s by radiation-damaged adults that are released in the wild populations. So this is uh, the, the ability to damage an insect's ability to reproduce and produce viable offspring is an old trick. Worked great. 
only now we have a very specific way to target it where every male that's released is guaranteed to not produce um, viable offspring. So super cool technology. This is a company called Oxitech in, uh, in the UK. I also had a nice com conversation with him on episode eight. So. <laughs> so any other questions on this one? Pretty neat technology. Another way that this has been used in animals that's pretty slick is something called EnviroPig. <laughs> so EnviroPig was a neat idea that one of the big problems we have with animal farming is their effluent. So what comes off the farm from their waste? And one of the big problems in pigs is um, phosphorus output that comes through in their feces. Um, you do have to feed pigs uh, um, a phosphorus supplement in order to, to do real well. And that shows in their manure. And um, this particular pig was engineered with an enzyme in its sal uh, saliva to more efficiently process uh, phosphate in, or phosphorus uh, or phosphate I as it was consuming in its diet and um, re decreased its output significantly. So it was the low phosphorus fecal pig and um, was a really, really great advantage that would be quite an environmental benefit. Um, unfortunately, this, is, uh, this one also kind of died on the vine. They didn't continue to produce this particular, pursue this particular product. The only enviro pigs that exist right now are uh, embryos in a bucket of liquid nitrogen up in Guelph. And uh, this could have been another really nice technology if we would have really had the courage to roll with it. And uh, still may come out in the future. Got a few more good ones for you here. Another one um, that actually did finally break through <clears throat> had to do with potatoes. So when you eat french fries, uh, from the most healthy organic potatoes from whatever farm you get them on, you're producing a carcinogen called uh, acrylamide. And uh, it happens through the Maillard reactions. It's a natural occurrence where um, <clears throat> specific amino acids combine with sugars to produce this compound. And um, it's shown on this slide here that uh, you have an amino acid called asparagine or, um, that is mixing with... Um, uh, that is combining with, with uh, sugars under heat to create something called acrylamide, which is uh, this kind of this nasty compound. It happens anytime you use excessive heat in the presence of specific compounds. So potatoes, coffee are good examples. Um, it's a finite or a very small increase in risk, but certainly is there. Um, so what this company did, uh, J.R. Simplot Company in, in uh, Boise, Idaho, they created a potato that was low in acrylamide by putting, um, a, 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 I keep wanting to say aspartate, asparagine synthase in, so they're, they're, in, they're expressing the gene to shut off production of that amino acid in the tuber of the plant. So specifically in that tuber, it shuts off half of the product that's required for acrylamide synthesis. So it makes a low amount of acryl acrylamide. So consumers have a healthier potato. The other thing they engineered into this was a block in browning. So by, um, and we'll talk about that in a second on a different crop. But the, on the bottom, you see examples here of their technology with a non-browning potato with a conventional browning potato. In potato production, something like 25% of potatoes are bruised and non-saleable. So they get culled. They either get thrown out or fed to animals. So can you imagine if you're the farmer who sees a 25% bump in yield because you have this non-browning potato? That's also healthier for consumers. So this was their thinking. Um, it's just started to be available. It's sold under the brand name White Russet. Last year was test marketed down in uh, Louisiana, and I'm not sure how it did, but um, I don't think consumers were immensely excited about it right off the bat. You didn't hear, mu hear or see much about it for or against it but um, it's something that may be more widely available today. They also see this as having more benefit in the uh, frozen potato market, that if you could have potatoes that once you cut them brown slower, that they'll look more attractive inside the bag or as you dump them into the skillet. So that's kind of the thinking, is a better production potato. The same kind of technology for the non-browning was done with apples. And last year, the, and I should mention, the potato you know, has been approved. That's 100% approved. Uh, non-browning apples. And this is where a, uh, an RNAi approach has been used, uh, this interference with that intermediate, throwing away the USB drive, 
um, to silence what's called polyphenol oxidase. It turns off an enzyme that's associated with taking the colorless compounds in fruit and converting them to a brown compound in the presence of oxygen. So uh, on the top, you see three slices of this arctic apple. On the bottom, conventional apple. And what it does is it keeps the apple looking more attractive longer, almost like you treated it with lemon juice, like we used to have to do. So here you don't have to have extra citric acid or whatever to make them stay attractive in a recipe or in a final application. The company thinks they'll see good examples of this in things like ciders that now won't turn brown. You know, they'll look a lot more attractive. Uh, apples that could be sold as slices or sold as uh, processed um, and uh, maintain their color better without additional chemicals. This is really nice because this is done at the time this went through approval. Uh, the company had four full-time employees. And so it's not just a game for, you know, BASF, Monsanto, Dow, Pioneer, you know. Um, this is done by small business, and they were able to get this through and approved. Um, it's currently, uh, they're bulking up trees. So you should see products from this within the next year or two. The next one's a really good example from here at University of Florida. Uh, tomato production is really important to the state of Florida, yet very intensive with respect to labor and with, with respect to inputs like chemicals to keep them free of disease. This is an example of the BS2 tomato. So BS2 is a very famous gene from peppers that scientists have known about for a long time. That peppers are resistant to certain bacterial disease because of what this trait they called BS2. And they found the gene that res is responsible for it. They then were able to move that BS2 gene from peppers into tomatoes. And now you grow the tomatoes, and they're relatively free of bacterial diseases. Um, so what you're looking at here on this slide are two sets of tomatoes. Uh, one set to the, like the left half, which are showing lots of symptoms of bacterial wilts, uh, wilted leaves, brown leaves. And then on the right, those that have the transgene, the pepper gene and happy green leaves and lots of fruit. And I neglected to mention that peppers are, an, are a cousin of tomatoes. They're both solanaceous crops. So it's not like you're taking a gene from a distant relative. It's actually from someone right down the evolutionary chain. So this is a really nice example because here you can have a plant that can protect itself from a bacterial disease. Uh, next slide shows this a little bit better. On the top, normal plants. On the bottom, those that are protected with the transgene. The other nice example, of, the other reason this is a nice example is because tomatoes, to get around these bacterial wilts, uh, farmers have to apply lots of copper. And copper is really the major control for bacterial wilts, uh, things like for xanthomonas and other bacterials, or bacteria that cause this. And copper, well, it's a heavy metal. It costs, it's toxic to the environment in high amounts, and it costs a lot of money. And I think this would be a really great example of how something like a, a transgenic tomato would be a great match for an organic farm. Because here you're able to use, in organic farms you can still use copper as an insect, as a pesticide, but um, uh, it's one more input, one more cost, six to ten pounds an acre of something that you need to pay someone to apply and washes off with the rain, so you need to apply it again. This would be a great example of a way that uh, technology could benefit people who work in a variety of different production systems. The next example is a good one, too, for Florida, because in Florida, we can't grow grapes, uh, at least the uh, Vitus vinifera, the traditional wine and table grapes, mostly because of a disease called Pierce's disease. And Pierce's disease is caused by a bacterium called uh, Xylella fastidiosum that lives in the vasculature and blocks the vasculature. And scientists here at the University of Florida uh, have created grape varieties that express a peptide that blocks the uh, that uh, helps, to, helps fight the bacteria. And so here you're looking at examples of infected plants on the left and on the right, those with the transgene on the right, and those without the transgene on the left. And the plants do very well. You don't need to apply antibacterial compounds or antimicrobial compounds, and could bring up an entire new industry here in Florida of being able to grow uh, grapes for winemaking and for the table. That's another one we don't use. Um, and it's not even in the deregulation process. This one, oh yeah. Grapes, well. yeah. Uh, grapes, the main reason they don't do well is because of Pierce's disease. Um, they, the, uh, it's spread by an insect called the glassy wing sharpshooter that visits one plant, 
gets some of the plant exudate in its mouth, travels to the next plant, bites it, and spreads the bacteria. It spreads like, like wildfire. And uh, you can grow grapes down here like muscadine grapes that are a different species of grape that are adapted for growth in uh, southern states. But um, they, they are not interfertile easily with vinifera, um, and, which is the normal you know, wine and table grape. Um, they're uh, Vitus rotundifolia that um, does real well here, but people don't like to eat them. Uh, I think they're awesome. I'm, and, the, and, you know, and the wine isn't like that kind of wine. It's real syrupy. It's real sweet. It's got lots of crazy flavors. I think it's fantastic, but it's different. You, know, you just have to retrain what your expectations are. If I think it's something that you know, some guy down in central Florida in, in, in their vineyard here or in you know, St. Augustine made, I'm all for it. And then they mix it with vinifera wine, and you know, it makes it a little bit more uh, traditional. Yeah. They use some muscadine. And uh, so San Sebastian and St. Augustine was the question. Yeah, they use, uh, I think most of their stuff is blended. So they use, they'll use Cabernet and other more traditional grapes uh, in conjunction with muscadines. And muscadines are a really interesting flavor. And if you haven't tried them, definitely give them a shot. Uh, hard to find in the stores right now. But um, the wine is there. Give it a shot. So um, back to the BT brinjal. OK, so this is one I spoke about earlier. Uh, eggplants are a huge food staple in places like India and Pakistan. And um, the problem is they're very susceptible to an insect called the root and, shoot, root and fruit borer, or fruit and shoot borer. And the fruit and shoot borer burrows into the fruit and the shoot, as the name would imply, and uh, causes damage to the crop. And it's a huge problem. And luckily, um, uh, well, unluckily, farmers there have been relying on um, old school insecticides, things like carbamates, uh, organophosphates, to control the pests. They're spraying 80 times a season. They're spraying with minimal personal protection equipment, maybe a scarf around their mouth, backpack sprayer, a couple of acres, uh, just to protect their crops so they can have their livelihood. Smallholder farmers. And um, the idea was, was to introduce that BT gene, so this gene that makes a, encodes a, a peptide that is toxic to this particular pest. doesn't affect other insects. It's, it, it's, it affects a very narrow range of boring insects. And the nice part about this is you're not killing everything with an insecticide. You're only killing those that nibble on that plant. So it kills the pest. Um, this has been an amazing success. This is only a few years ago it was distributed to two farmers. They did very well. There are no restrictions on use of the seeds. They can be freely distributed or buy new ones from the company. But now this next year, it'll be 5,000 farmers who are growing this in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, a very poor country with a lot of people. And being able to produce more food with fewer chemicals, uh, the, if, you can, if you can follow up on this one, a very good uh, episode in the podcast, but also some beautiful videos online about the BT Brinjal. Uh, a filmmaker named Hide Burzma from... Uh, um, Netherlands did a beautiful, beautiful series of videos interviewing these farmers. And when they say this eggplant allowed me to uh, switch from a wood house to a brick house, or send my child to school, or spray twice a year rather than 80 times a year, um, they are stories that get you kind of choked up a little bit because you see the way that technology finally is helping somebody. The sad part is, is that this technology was originally designed for India. And India approved it. They went all the way through the process, well, I should say, one step short of approval. And at the highest, so all the scientists, all the regulators looked at it, and everybody said, this is great. This will be of tremendous benefit. The ag minister said no. One person, under tremendous political pressure, stopped a solution from reaching people. So they go spray. Bangladesh's ag minister, tiny little woman, said, we'll take it. And they're doing wonderful stuff. So. It's, it's, it's a great story, and one I really hope you follow up on if you're interested. We're getting towards the end, and there's a few more things that are still of, uh, I really should end with eggplants, but in the developing, in the industrialized world, we're seeing changes in the way that we're uh, finding oils for cooking. And this is a good example. The stuff Plenish has a high oleic acid content. It's much more stable than other um, healthy oils, which, which can go rancid at a higher level than more saturated oils. And so... It's an uh, improvement of the diet in the, in the Western world, which is a really important thing for us. 
this is another compound that, uh, another product that should be available very soon, if not already. The big issue here in Florida, citrus greening disease. So you're familiar with the citrus greening disease as a bacterial disease of the plant, which is spread by an insect. And uh, it's affected something like 90% of groves are, show signs of infection. Uh, we know that when the tree is infected, it pretty much is a one-way trip. Um, why some trees can improve with certain treatments of antibiotics or other compounds or fertilizers, generally it's a, it's a, it's a death sentence. Uh, the main problem is poor yield, misshapen fruits, tree, fruit that fall from the tree, uh, the juice quality is off. So it's, it's a huge loss for the state of Florida, lots of jobs lost in the process. And the problem is the industry can't wait for a solution. If you're a farmer who's suffering from this on your land, you either have to sell the operation or, um, or you, know, you can't just mothball uh, a farm or mothball a packaging plant. Uh, you have to shut it down, and it's probably a one-way trip there, too. So how do we get around this one? Well, there's been a series of genes that have been introduced to citrus, which have good evidence of working. Um, one of these is called a defensin, and these are proteins that tend to work into the uh, membranes of bacteria and disrupt them, causing problems with the bacteria and, and allowing them to grow more slowly or die. And uh, these have been introduced into citrus and look very good. And they've been reasonable solutions now uh, that in the field, uh, probably going on five, six, seven years, that still look very good. Um, those are being done by a company here in Florida. The uh, University of Florida has produced a number of solutions from what they call lytic peptides, so peptides that affect the bacteria, to genes from plants that when installed in plants, plant defense genes that when installed in citrus confer resistance, much like BS2 does onto tomato. <clears throat> Right now, it looks like the earliest we'll see deregulation is 2019. And once that happens, you only need 60 million trees to get Florida up to speed. So this is going to be another problem uh, where genetic engineering could solve a problem, but uh, is slow to get through the regulatory hurdles. Uh, this is one that comes from my lab. This is uh, uh, strawberries, which don't need fungicide. And one of the big complaints about strawberries is that they're fungicide intensive that farmers who grow them have to use lots of protection to make a marketable fruit. And we've used a gene from, from uh, strawberries and Arabidopsis, a small mustard, to fortify those plants from bacterial and fungal diseases. Now you can spray those all day with fungal spores and they'll never die. Uh, these guys who aren't transformed, they game over. So um, it's another way that we could have a healthier strawberry for the environment and for the consumer, um, but this technology has not gone forward and won't anytime soon. So the last thing I'll talk on about is uh, gene editing. I really want you to see some of the breakthroughs that have come through this technology. We spoke on it last week uh, briefly about this is the process where you can make very specific changes in the DNA of an organism, um, directed, specific, and with no hardware left behind. So you're able to create mutations that are where you want them, create the changes that you need to see. There's two good examples where this was used. Gene editing um, in cows. And you have dairy cattle that have horns that make really nice milk, not so great with the beef. You've got black Angus that don't grow horns, not very good milk, good beef, right? So if you wanted to try to get good horns and good beef in the same place, it might take a long time to do as a breeding exercise. It might take 150 years. If you cross those two together, you get a cow that's not much good for anything. However, we know what gene causes the horns. There's a specific transcription factor. So there's a regulatory gene that has a, a mistake inside the beginning, inside the black Angus. So this mistake causes there to be no horns. Could that mutation be installed in that organism, inside this dairy cow, to be able to grow dairy cattle that now produce no horns? And it's been done. Uh, it was done by University of California Davis working in conjunction with a company called Recombinetics. They were able to introduce the black Angus mutation into dairy cattle, changing only that one single gene. And those cows are alive and well today, over here on the right. Uh, they just were talked about on Science Friday last week, so if you're interested in listening. Um, normally, farmers have to pay a veterinarian to remove those horn buds, which is kind of painful for the cow, costs money for the farmer, it's another expense. 
and it's good to have our cattle producers be able to produce cows that don't grow horns for the safety of themselves and for other, other animals. So this is a one really nice application of the technology. Another one is in the uh, pig that is virus resistant. This is my last example. Um, there's something called African swine fever virus, which spreads very rapidly among uh, hog populations and is devastating the hog industry in places in Eastern Europe right now. And the animals get incredibly sick from this disease. Wild pigs, so bush pigs, other wild pigs, don't get this disease. What's really interesting is that scientists at the Roslyn Institute, where they came up with the chicken that doesn't get avian influenza, they tested the hypothesis that specific genes in the bush pig, where they find mutations in uh, the way the virus turns on the cell, or the way the virus exploits the cell. The bush pig has some mutations in these genes that they've now introduced by CRISPR, fixed those mutations using gene editing in domestic pigs. So now they have domestic pigs that have the only difference between them and this wild pig on the bottom is this one single change in this one gene. And they're now testing them to see if they're resistant to the disease. So what I showed you today are lots of solutions that could benefit consumers, the environment, the needy, and farmers. Uh, there's a lot of examples that um, really could do very good things. Uh, examples in Bangladesh where they actually they have escaped from regulation and criticism to be able to do what they were meant to do. Um, it's also important to mem remember that really within uh, you know, a, a thousand meters of where we're sitting right now, there are probably a hundred sets of seeds in cold rooms, refrigerators, and greenhouses that have solutions that could help people in the planet that will die there um, because of a regulatory network and consumer pushback against technologies. And we'll talk about that next week. And that's really where we're going next. If we got so many good ideas, why don't we use them? What's holding it back? And next week we'll talk about the problems that hold them back, the regulatory loops that they go through, as well as ways that we can help lower that threshold so that these good technologies can get out to meet the people that they were meant to serve.